I would like to share this honor with my collaborator, uh, Larry Carter, who unfortunately died uh, a few years ago. So, forecasting the length of life, who would dare attempt it? Um, any one of us might die at any moment, and who can pretend to understand or know mortality and its, its future? And who would be so foolish as to try to predict it? Well, if someone did try to predict it, then we might think it would surely be a biologist or a medical doctor or a biomedical technician, technologist, or something of the sort. Uh, but in fact, uh, demographers and statisticians uh, have, of course, uh, made efforts in this direction. And although the work of a demographer or a statistician on forecasting mortality might be dismissed as uh, laughable or uh, audacious, too, too bold, because what could a, uh, a demographer or statistician really know about the subject? In fact, demographers and statisticians have been uh, quite successful in forecasting mortality over the years. And Larry Carter and I are in that group of, of demographers who've tackled this problem. So uh, how is it possible? Well, it, it's possible for demographers and statisticians to make a contribution because the, there are such regular patterns in mortality. We observe the same age pattern in mortality, the same in some important respects, over centuries of observed historical data and across the world uh, today. So the age pattern has a, a very strong internal structure. And then we also see that the changes over time in mortality have been, for the most part, uh, very regular and fairly slow and stable. And this has persisted even though we have gone from mortality that is largely a matter of infectious and contagious diseases and very high mortality in childhood and so on, to a world in which mortality is largely a matter of uh, old age mortality and chronic uh, health problems and heart and cancer and, and, and so on. Through all of that, these patterns have remained uh, quite stable. And through the discovery of new therapies like antibiotics or um, uh, treatments for tuberculosis, which is very important 100 years ago, and um, hypertensive drugs and so on, uh, still mortality decline keeps chugging along in a very regular and systematic way. And uh, this is a, a mystery. How can it be and why should it be? Uh, and I don't know the answer, but there it is. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on my own work and my work, my work with Larry Carter and my work with um, later collaborators. And of course, there's a, a, a large and, and rapidly growing uh, body of work by other people in this area. And um, I must say, I haven't really uh, fully kept up with it. At first, after the, our article was published, I tried to, but it quickly got out of hand. And then it became much more technical than I am uh, uh, geared up to uh, understand. And so I apologize to the people who've been working in this area whose work I won't be um, discussing, but there it is. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about the um, Lee Carter model a bit, and then I'm going to 
uh, talk about an approach of putting this in an international context instead of looking at one country at a time. Then I'll talk about some changes over sort of slow changes in a kind of rotation of the age distribution of mortality and how that might be taken into account. I'll talk about uncertainty in uh, how to represent it for policymakers and so on. And then finally, I'll talk about some deeper issues in, in the future of mortality. Okay, so let's start with the basic Lee Carter model. And it's useful to look at uh, some data. These, this is just uh, uh, age-specific death rates in the United States in the 20th century. It could have been uh, uh, many other countries, almost any country, really. Uh, so there, the, the lines, of course, are, each line is an age-specific death rate over the course of a century. This is on a log scale. Um, now, uh, so the first thing we note uh, is that the levels of mortality vary enormously by age, and Nicole just uh, showed us uh, that uh, a moment uh, ago. And we have to certainly capture that in any modeling we do. We see that some uh, age, death rates at some age change much more rapidly than they do at other ages, and that's infant mortality that's uh, picked out there. Um, and uh, we also see that the rate of decline is quite stable over time. That is, each of these lines is close to a straight line, which would be a constant rate of decline uh, for each age group. But at the same time, we see that there are exceptions. So here we have uh, mortality of young adults, and uh, you can see that uh, in, in the later decades, it just it hasn't declined in the same way as at other ages, and that's uh, sort of a, a, a break in the general pattern I described. And then there are other things, like uh, that's the influenza pandemic of 1918. Well, it's striking that uh, it affected mostly uh, sort of young adult ages and younger ages, and you can see that there are some older ages there that weren't affected at all. And so that's um, another sort of deviation that uh, we could try to take into account, but uh, in fact, in the Lee Carter model, we just uh, ignore, we assume, assume away. Uh, and there, uh, HIV AIDS would be another case like that that was fairly age specific in its incidence. Okay, so the Lee Carter model, um, tries to capture some of those important patterns I was just pointing out. The, uh, the uh, MXT is the age-specific death rates, and uh, we look at the log of that. Then in the Lee Carter model, the, the log of the age-specific death rate in a given year is a, an additive uh, factor in age, that A of X. That's capturing the variation across age and the shape of mortality, the level of mortality. And then uh, the fact that mortality declines at different rates at different ages, that's captured by the BX uh, function there. Um, so BX is high at young ages that decline rapidly and lower at older ages. And then the general trend of mortality is captured by the K, which I think of as an index of the general level of mortality. Um, and then we have um, the fact that this isn't going to fit perfectly at any age or time, and so we have this uh, epsilon error term. Um, now, when we look at that, it's clear that um, like Nicole, I can't really read what uh, my notes say here, but uh, <laughs> so um, that's here. Okay, so the correlation structure of errors across age, the correlation structure, that epsilon, uh, is not part of this model. It could be sort of tacked on as an additional thing, but it's not really part of the original model. 
The long-term trends that I mentioned a moment ago, it, what we call a rotation of the relative rate of decline, that uh, the changes in that BX factor turn out to be important. I'm going to talk about those later, but the, those aren't really part of the original model. And then shocks like uh, influenza epidemic or HIV AIDS are not going to be captured properly. And a, a very big point is that there are no cohort specific factors here. This is a period model that's driven by whatever happens in a given year. Uh, Okay, so, move on. Now, th here are estimates of the AX and BX functions. There's the BX, um, and here is the AX, and you can, see, uh, you can see the AX is high at young ages and then uh, low at very old ages and a rather flat in between in this fitting for the United States, which is off of data from 1933 to 2013. And then the BX is also, as I, I just described that wrong. The one on the bottom is, is AX. The one on the top is the BX. It's high at the young ages and then flat and, then, and so on. Okay. Um, and then the KT is also fit here. And, uh, the solid line is the KT, <clears throat> and the idea in the Lee, original Lee Carter was that we calculate that KT and then we simply model it as a statistical time series uh, process using standard uh, ARIMA techniques. And we did that, and what came out was a random walk with drift. Well, that wasn't part of the original idea. I think we were very surprised to see that, just as we were very surprised to see this um, quite linear trend. Um, and then we were even more surprised when uh, this was done for other countries, and the same random walk with drift was, well, different rates of drift, different levels of drift, but was found for country after country, near Europe, uh, Latin America, and so on. That was a total surprise. And so now I would say the Lee Carter model is thought of as in including this idea that mortality, the level of mortality can be well modeled by a random walk with drift. Well, that's sort of an empirical uh, outcome, which uh, isn't necessarily part of the model, but that's the way uh, things turned out. And so our article was published in 1992, but actually the data, the last data point we had was 1989. And uh, so what I've shown, uh, the arrow there is about at 1992, and you can see that the additional 21 years, and actually it's an additional 24 years maybe of data uh, that we had, it's still well, very much on that same linear trend, and it's even more linear than the earlier years had been. So this is quite remarkable, and as I suggested earlier, it's very difficult to understand why this should be so. It certainly defies my uh, powers of explanation. Of course, there's that wobble in the 1950s and 60s, probably had something to do with uh, smoking and smoking-related mortality, the timing's right for that, but in any event, that's the basic picture. And then with our model of KT, we can then uh, project KT with a probability uh, distribution into the future, and then using our estimated equation, we can transform the forecasts of KT and the probability interval into uh, probability intervals and forecasts for the age-specific rates. And since their variations are perfectly uh, correlated, then we can translate that into a probability interval for life expectancy. And so what is shown here is just a continuation uh, of a, a 1933 to 2013. Uh, it's the database, and then there's a projection over 75 years out to 2088. Uh, I usually do 75 years because that's what our uh, public pension system in the U.S. Uh, does. And 
calls for. Okay, so that's uh, a quick run through um, the Lee Carter structure. Now, so in the Lee Carter approach, we're forecasting um, using data from a single country, at least as we originally imagined it. And often, however, uh, we, well, we may want to do sexes, uh, you know, separate forecasts for males and females in the same country. And if you do that with just two separate Lee Carter analyses, you get results that don't always make much sense. Uh, for example, they usually project a, a, an increasing uh, a widening of the uh, sex difference in life expectancy, whereas a narrowing would probably be more uh, realistic. So sex mortality by sex is one example. Uh, Departement in France or the provinces in Canada would be another example where we first started working on this. But uh, perhaps more interesting for many purposes is uh, looking across a group of countries. Um, so I'll show you some results for uh, a group of the 20, 20 countries with lowest mortality uh, in the world in an article that I did with Nan Lee. Th this idea, the idea of using international patterns to strengthen single country forecasts isn't so original. So the Open Vopel article, which I'll be showing a chart from in a moment, or an article by White, or earlier work I did, and so on, all suggest this idea, and there's some regression approaches out there in the literature. Um, what I'm going to describe now is uh, not a regression approach exactly. It's closer to the Lee Carter model. So uh, we call this coherent mortality forecasting, and in it we use judgment to form a group of populations, uh, say, 20 countries with the lowest mortality would be one way of defining such a group. And then using the population data on these countries, we create a super population by adding them all up in a population weighted way. And then we fit a Lee Carter model to this super population of the 20 uh, lowest mortality countries. And uh, from, that, from that fitted model, we get residuals for each country. And I should say, in that fitted model, it's just the BX and KT that is taken. Every country has its own, uh, I said that wrong, let me, let me go back. Uh, so we have that, uh, yes, we subtract the AX for each country, then we estimate the overall uh, KT and BX. There are residuals for each country. We model those residuals using a sort of second step uh, of a Lee Carter model. We forecast the residuals, um, and if all goes well, then that forecast uh, shows that the differences are decaying over time, which is generally uh, the case. <clears throat> and then we end up with a forecast that has some commonality, but it also respects <clears throat> individual differences in the age shape of mortality and the level of mortality. So what you get is the same rates of decline ultimately for every country. Okay. Now, this is an example applied to uh, forecast by sex in Sweden. And uh, you can see I've labeled there uh, what each of those lines is. But the outermost, the highest line is a separate uh, forecast for females in Sweden. The lowest line is a separate forecast for males. And you can see that that shows a widening uh, of the difference between them. But when you do this coherent forecast, you see the opposite. Uh, so instead of expanding to a difference of seven or eight years uh, by 2100, here, uh, in the coherent forecast, it contrasts, it contracts to a difference of maybe three uh, years or so, which uh, I, in fact, think is more realistic. And if we look at a group of countries, let's skip over that, uh, 
but there we did, uh, of those 20 countries, after sort of diagnostics, we could include 15 of them in this coherent forecast. And here I've pulled out three of those 15. So for Japan, um, doing the coherent forecast, and these are sexes combined, the coherent forecast means that the projected uh, mortality for Japan is lower than it would otherwise be by, uh, I think, three or four years. Let's see, do I? No, I don't show that. And I can't, yes, I can go back. Okay, so mortality, would, life expectancy would be lower by three or four years because Japan is way out uh, ahead of most of the other countries, and doing it as a group suggests that that won't continue indefinitely. And the U.S., on the other hand, improves by about a year. This is in a forecast to 2050. Um, it suggests that life expectancy would be about a year higher at something like 85 in 2050. Uh, and for Denmark, there's a gain of uh, two or three years by being treated as part of this group. So the idea is that the per poor performance of the U.S. in recent decades is, is not a permanent aspect of U.S. mortality. And similarly for Denmark, and the, and the stellar performance of Japan is also not a permanent feature of Japanese mortality, but that uh, it also is transitory. It may last a number of decades, but its lead will eventually decay somewhat. So that's the idea behind uh, coherent uh, mortality forecasts. And this is an example. We also, we here being um, Nan Li and I, uh, we also looked at uh, Russia and five uh, Eastern European countries that were members of the formal, former USSR. Um, and we made the subjective assumption there that, in fact, the common factor forecasts that we were just looking at for the 15 uh, low mortality countries would give a better picture of the future for uh, these countries than would their own rather poor uh, histories in the past. And so uh, we did diagnostics of those six countries the method only seemed sensible for three of them, uh, but for these three countries, well, one of them is Lithuania, the other was Czechoslovakia, and the former East Germany, which is treated as a continuing entity here. So what I show is for Lithuania, uh, the lower left panel, if we had <coughs> projected with a standard Lee Carter, we would have projected declining mortality, uh, declining life expectancy, when we do it in the coherent approach, we have uh, strongly rising life expectancy. Um, under the standard Lee Carter, there's a relatively narrow probability interval. For the coherent forecast, it becomes very wide because, in fact, the coherent model doesn't fit the history very well, even though we think it will fit the future very well. So that's an example of the kinds of things that uh, you get out of this coherent approach. Okay, uh, the third thing I want to do now is talk about what I've called the rotation of the age distribution of mortality. And this is also uh, reflecting work by uh, Nan Li uh, and Patrick uh, Gerlan. Uh, these are demographers at the United Nations, and uh, they wanted to. Uh, adapt the Lee Carter model to do forecasts at the United Nations, but uh, they knew there were some problems at those lower ages that Nicole was showing us with uh, sort of peculiar results under uh, Lee Carter, possibly. And so the idea was to uh, note that there have been changes in the rate of mortality decline by age, which I'll show you in a moment, and figure out some way to deal with those. So. Um, this panel of charts uh, shows the rate of, just the average rate of decline by age in mortality in the first half of the 20th century compared to the second half of the 20th century. Here in four countries, uh, which I can't read, but let's see, we have uh, Sweden, 
France, uh, Canada, and Japan. And results for the U.S. look quite similar, and I think for maybe for all uh, low mortality, high life expectancy countries, results would look much like this. What we see is the, the red arrows are showing the rate of decline by age in the first half of the century. The green arrow points to the line showing the rate of decline um, in the second half of the century. And you can see this rotation. That is, the rate of decline at young ages has dropped, and the rate of decline at, at the older ages has increased. Um, and that's what we're trying to address. There's been, um, well, that's just the, the pattern. Okay, so um, this shows the age patterns for the United States that are part of the projection I showed earlier with a jump off year of 2013 for the US. So those first two lines of log mortality are showing the actual observed pattern and then the uh, arrow is pointing to the pattern projected for 2088, um, 75 years later. And the question is whether this projected pattern is implausible. So Jerosi and uh, King, who had a very nice book on forecasting mortality, suggest that Lee Carter produces implausible results uh, that uh, the decline, the, the change in mortality between, uh, say, mid-teen mid years and early 20s is just too rapid, that line is too steep. And, uh, and then there's the question of whether mortality can be so low. So Nicole was saying it's essentially zero, um, one to 10. And here, and um, I think that was when it was 19 per 100,000. Here it's uh, one per 100,000. Uh, for a five or six year old, it's pretty hard to imagine that uh, that could be realistic. Uh, it's difficult to imagine the future, but uh, okay, I can, agree that uh, perhaps the Lee Carter just leads to too extreme a result by extrapolating forever uh, these uh, historical rates of decline by age. So uh, without going into, well, let me show this pattern, which is from uh, low mortality countries. What is shown here is a ratio of the actual observed infant mortality rate to mortality at ages 15 to 19 and on the horizontal axis is life expectancy. And you can see that uh, that ratio declines as we move to higher levels of life expectancy. Uh, but then it appears that that curve is flattening out. And that flattening out uh, suggests that the ratios are becoming, that the rate of decline is becoming closer and closer for infant mortality and mortality at 15 to 19. Uh, whereas earlier at lower life expectancies, say in the late 60s, uh, the rate of decline for infant mortality was much more rapid. So this is the sort of problem we're trying to address. And this is done by um, we, up to eight life expectancy of 80. We make no change in the standard Lee Carter, but after that, uh, we introduce a rotation of the BX curve towards a horizontal shape up to age 85. And that seems to be consistent with uh, the pattern we see in recent years in the low mortality countries. We would end up then with a BX curve that was the, the same above, aid, above life expectancies of 80. The BX curve would be the same at age uh, uh, zero and at age 70. As I say, that seems to be empirically approximately correct. Um, so uh, this shows how much difference that makes. Uh, for the U.S., um, this is in, let's see, the top two lines contrast a standard uh, Lee Carter with this adjusted Lee Carter. For 2048, there's essentially no difference that you can see, and that's because life expectancy is that not that much above 80. And then for 2098, I think it is, um, the lower ones, you can see the contrast between those two, or two lower lines. Um, since this is on a log scale, that's 
quite a big difference and it's less easy to see, but again, because it's a log scale, but at uh, the higher ages, uh, mortality has declined more. At the lower ages, it has declined less. It, the way we have done it, it has no effect on life expectancy overall, and uh, as Nicole said, it just, it doesn't, these rates are so low at those younger ages, it doesn't matter much for uh, life expectancy. Okay. So, um, now uncertainty. So, um, I think population forecasters and mortality forecasters have uh, a professional responsibility to uh, give their users uh, information about how uncertain their forecasts are, what sort of probability there is associated with those forecasts. And of course, there are many ways of doing this, most traditionally just with uh, high-low scenarios and so on. But uh, probabilistic intervals emerge in a natural way from the Lee Carter method, and that's one of the nice features of that approach. Um, so I'm not sure what the current situation is. I haven't seen recent studies of this, but I know that um, before 2000, um, both official statistical agencies and the United Nations, for example, uh, had a tendency to underpredict life expectancy gains in the future. Um, and there were systematic studies done then. This is a study of the United Nations uh, projections. This study was a U.S. National Academy uh, of Sciences study that came out in 1999. So the United Nations forecasts were all done before that, some of them long before that. And so what is shown here is the, um, the error at different forecast horizons. So that goes from zero to 25 year forecast horizons on the horizontal axis. That lower red arrow is pointing to the average forecast error in years for the US, Australia, and Japan. Um, and you can see that at uh, 25 years, there's about a four year, let's see, did I indicate that? No, it, uh, after 25 years, there's about a four, four year shortfall. Yeah, it's about a four year shortfall in the, uh, in the lower curve. And for Europe, it's about a year and a half or two years. Uh, so the systematic understatement of life expectancy gains, and then those translate into an understatement of future numbers of elderly and so on. So that was the UN. Uh, I, my guess is that is no longer happening, um, but this is part of the motivation for doing analysis of errors. This is a study that uh, Tim Miller and I did on the U.S. Social Security Administration projections and their errors um, since 1957. And uh, again, you see a standard um, understatement, underprediction of future mortality gains. Again, we have this by uh, horizon. And uh, there's something like a uh, uh, two and a half, three year understatement by the end, and you can see how it increases. Uh, now this is the, how the, the actual published Lee Carter forecast, published in 1992, but with a base year of 1989, you can see how that's the red dots or the, uh, the forecasts and the blue line is the uh, actual as it is unfolded. And you can see there was an initial jump off error, uh, but, and that error has just carried forward. But those errors are in the order of a half year and they don't seem to be increasing. Um, we can do more systematic analysis however, and um, so let's see, let me just move on here. So Tim Miller 
and I, another collaborator, did an analysis in which we imagined that we were earlier in the 20th century and trying to use the Lee Carter method to forecast the future. So we start uh, in imagining that we're in 1920 and we have 20 years of data since 1900 and we do a one year ahead forecast and we do a 50 year ahead forecast and so on, every possible horizon. And then we do the same thing starting in 1921 and so on. So we end up with, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 uh, forecasts which can be compared to actual outcomes and we fit the Lee Carter model uh, then three or four thousand times just using the data that are available. Um, but we couldn't do diagnostics every single time for the KT model, so we just assume it's a random walk with drift and then estimate the, uh, the drift and the variance each time. And so from that, we construct this table, which uh, gives us the mean forecast error the signed forecast error uh, at each horizon, and uh, that's in that leftmost column, let's see, that column. And those are all negative also. So we, we also are always under predicting on average uh, at, every, uh, at every horizon. And um, then this last is showing the percentage of the forecasts that are falling within the 95%, the theoretical 95% probability interval. And you can see that on average, 97% are falling within what's supposed to be a 95% interval. So our intervals are a bit too wide, but they're not terrible. And uh, also you can see this problem is greater. Our, our short run Okay. Uh, our intervals for shorter horizons, I can't quite see how far that goes up, but for the shorter horizons, our intervals are too wide. For the longer horizons, they're a little bit too narrow, but this isn't uh, too bad. Um, in any event, uh, that's what we've done. We can plot those results against um, uh, horizon and compare them to the Social Security Administration that I showed you earlier. So I've simply added the Lee Carter uh, record to the Social Security Administration record and you can see that uh, the forecast errors on average are much uh, lower. Okay, so um, what a policymaker gets or an analyst gets is a probability distribution for future mortality. The, the difficulty is, uh, I imagine this isn't true for analysts in, in uh, life insurance and, and so on, but so far as public pensions go, no one really knows what to do with a probability distribution. And in fact, a probability distribution by itself, I would say, is almost useless uh, because you have to know the whole autocovariance structure of the errors. If all you know is the probability well, for many purposes, what you need is the whole trajectory of life expectancy uh, and the errors made in projecting it and so on. And all of these, it, it's the cumulative effect that is going to affect things like pension fund balances or uh, the size of some fund. Um, and so just having the probability uh, intervals is not uh, that, that helpful. So what you really need is, um, these stochastic sample paths. So this is an example of I don't know how many, uh, maybe a hundred stochastic sample paths for in the K forecast, and for each of those you can construct the whole forecast of uh, mortality by age. And then as, as an analyst or a, a pension fund manager or something, you would then along each of those stochastic sample paths, you would calculate your uh, quantities of interest, the tax revenues that come in, the benefits that are paid out, and so on. And then you get the trust fund uh, outcome at whatever year you want, and you get a whole probability distribution from it that's derived from uh, analyzing these stochastic sample paths. So I think that is generally the way policymakers should be uh, educated to use this new kind of information that is so different than a scenario type of projection. 
Um, yes, uh, I'll. So I'm in, uh, towards the closer, close to the end here, I think. So this is the famous <coughs> Epen Vopel chart, which I imagine uh, most of you have seen. Um, <coughs> It shows the highest female life expectancy, and there's a similar one for males, uh, each year at a national level since uh, 1840. And, well, there are many remarkable things about this, but I think the most remarkable, the most striking for people, is its linearity. So we've seen that in the Lee Carter uh, fitting, the, the KT factor is declining linearly with time. Here we see the open Vopel uh, analysis uh, in which uh, the record life expectancy is rising linearly over time for 160 years, and that's continued now. We have another 15, well, 13, 14 years worth of data, uh, and it's continued to rise linearly at this pace of 25 years per century two and a half years per decade, and 15 minutes per hour. Um, so, how do we understand that? I have no idea. I was asked to write a paper on that subject for a meeting, and I did my best, but I don't have any good explanation of that. It seems completely counterintuitive to me, counter to expectations. This is what I would have expected to see for mortality over time, um, a sort of a global measure like this, or a national measure. Um, and so what's, what's going on? I think probably most people would expect something like this, maybe with a lot of disagreement about what's happening at the top end. So one possibility is that, uh, well, we've just blundered onto a, a segment as part of this sigmoid curve that happens to be fairly linear, as I've shown here with that red line. Uh, and in that case, it looks like we're, you know, we maybe have another couple of decades to go, but uh, uh, it, we're going to start seeing a deceleration of improvement soon. On the other hand, maybe it's like this, and we're at a linear segment uh, early in this process with a lot of room left for change in the future. Um, in that case, we may have another century of rapid uh, uh, increase along the open Vopel or Lee Carter lines. Or it might be like this, where we've pretty much used up this part of uh, the sigmoid curve, and we're very shortly going to be experiencing deceleration. So this is all uh, an open question, but I think it's accurate to say that um, so far, there's no indication, really, of a deceleration. There's no indication that we are approaching the end of this uh, sort of roughly linear section in the middle. But I think that's, these are the most important uh, questions, probably, for people trying to forecast mortality now. Can we just plow ahead sort of blindly with our linear models, uh, or is something more complicated uh, about to happen? And so uh, I hope it's still true, but I saw that Tom Kirkwood uh, was on the uh, program and would be speaking to us, and I think he, would, he will be addressing uh, deeper issues, uh, maybe not exactly linearity, but a deeper understanding of the mortality process itself. Um, there's been a lot of research on mortality in other organisms, like uh, yeast, mice, uh, fruit flies, Mediterranean fruit flies, little worms, nematodes, and so on. Um, and in the lab, we've We've varied the environment, the diet, the temperature shocks. Uh, there have been gene therapies tried and uh, studies of the longevity of different uh, of sort of genomes uh, in each of these. And uh, there can be big variations uh, in, in lifespan, an average 
life expectancy of, of, by a factor of two or three years. Uh, that's been very striking and it gives some indication it may be possible to do something of the sort with humans. There's been a lot of debate about to what extent uh, our lifespan is fixed. Ah, so I need to finish quickly now, and I will. Um, so I think the, um, the evidence that uh, gene therapy, stem cell therapy, new bio, uh, biomedical technologies, and so on are having a, a big effect on this underlying trend in mortality, that evidence is not really uh, available yet. That is, there's, I don't think there's indication that we're seeing a sudden acceleration because of these things. Rather, you might say, well, these are the ways in which the linear increase is taking place. Um, so, uh, to end, the Lee Carter approach, and probably what most people do, is based on a kind of business as usual uh, extrapolation of historical trends. The probability that that is a good idea or a bad idea, well, it's just not really known. It's not known how important the emerging technologies will be. But personally, I expect we're going to have at least another several decades of just chugging along the way we have in the past and that the future will be not so different uh, than the present. Thank you. So we're working with Isfa, Edouard de I will do a, a talk today about, about uh, similar things. Um, uh, you've showed that the beta X uh, is changing, uh, so less improvement, mortality improvement at low ages, and as uh, Nicole Elkaoui said, at high ages it's in important, and at high ages it's going to the right. Um, isn't it uh, saying that, in fact, the focal point of view, the linear extrapolation of life expectancy, is probably happening more than the Lee Carter model? In the initial paper of the Lee Carter model, you described that it was naturally decelerating, and it was good because that's what you were thinking yeah. at that time. That was normal to think so, uh, but today people think no. It's as you've just described. Yeah. It's going the linear uh, uh, the linear extrapolation of life expectancy perhaps makes more sense than the initial Lee Carter model. Yeah. So, what do you think? Yeah. No, Lee that's a, that's an excellent uh, question, and I've I've found. Well, I think this rotation is, in fact, uh, what makes it possible that uh, the Lee Carter has worked pretty well, even though the Lee Carter is predicting a deceleration. But once, once the death rates at younger ages reach a, become quite low, then what's happening there doesn't matter much. And then we switch to something more like a Gompertz world that Vopel emphasizes, and in that Gompertz world, then uh, both Lee Carter and the Vopel story can be true at the same time. Um, is, that, is that what's going on? I'm, I'm not sure, but it's the, the best I can, uh, I can do. But you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a contradiction. We developed that model in the context of U.S. mortality. Well, in U.S. mortality, life expectancy it did decelerate uh, by about 50% in the second half of the century. And so that all seemed consistent, and then I just was astonished when I saw that open Vopel curve. Um, so, uh, very interesting question, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Yang Yang from school. I have a couple of questions about the coherent approach. Um, you mentioned, I think it's, sen it's sensible because the coherent approach would uh, increase the data credibility for small countries. But there are some genuine countries showing some gender gap, increasing mortality gender gap, such as Japan. Is it reasonable to ignore such gender gap? And probably it will kind of, uh, the gender gap will uh, narrow at some point, but is it reasonable for short term? And the next question is probably if we use the super data, it probably de de derived by the large, comp large countries, then how do we standardize the impact? Yeah, so uh, let me start with the first question. Um, 
Yes, so these different trends in the uh, sex gap in mortality. I think the best way to go in analyzing those now is by going beyond uh, the Lee Carter and the coherent and all of this and doing something that uh, Sam Preston and his collaborators uh, has, has done, have done, which is to uh, incorporate information on cohort smoking behavior into a Lee Carter type model. For the US, uh, this explains a great deal of the changes in the widening and narrowing sex gap. The men started smoking heavily first. There's about a 20 year delay before that begins affecting mortality. Then the women started smoking and again, so there was a delayed effect on their mortality. That has been happening for women in the US in the last 20 years or so. Their increase in life expectancy has slowed way down. Uh, I think for European countries. I'm not sure about how this history is in Japan. I imagine it started with men and then spread to women. But then I think there's quite a predictable uh, change in, in, in the future. So uh, uh, Preston and his collaborators, uh, Jessica Ho, um, did uh, smoking and obesity, uh, where they have cohort histories added on to a Lee Carter framework. I think that's what I would do if I were trying to explain that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, these individual level differences can be very important. Individual country differences. And the second one, uh, we'll pass over that maybe for now. We could uh, get me in coffee. <laughs> Is there a last question? Okay, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Ronald. Yeah. So I'm Najan Mikawi from uh, University Paris Dauphine. And um, uh, wh what about developing countries? Uh, I'm thinking more specifically about African country. Uh, could you expect the same trend and could you use also uh, your model for this yeah. region? Thank you. Well, uh, of course, for the African, for the sub-Saharan African countries, the, the data are very poor and a lot of the data are model generated, in fact, already. Uh, but I think this work you know, by these people at the UN was partly motivated by the problems of uh, projecting mortality for those countries. I, I, I'm not an expert on uh, the sub-Saharan sub African demography. I, I have no reason to think it's going to unfold in a very different way. It may be that the basic age pattern as, get, as gets captured by the AXs is going to be somewhat different, but um, I think the general approach uh, probably will, will work uh, reasonably well there. North Africa is probably quite a different story, and I imagine life expectancy is already close to 70 or something. A little bit more, 75, yeah. So um, I really don't know anything about those patterns. Do they look quite different? Do, is your sense that it's quite different? It's quite different between North Africa, uh, Af North African country and Sub-Saharan. Uh, yeah, that yeah, would be totally different. different. But yeah. how about North Africa and Europe? North Africa, we and France. have yeah, quite the same trend, life expectancy yeah. that we have in some European country. Yeah, so I would expect it would work, uh, wor would work well there, but right now for Sub-Saharan Africa, there are these enormous data problems and there's the HIV AIDS uh, catastrophe and it will, you know, that sort of thing is going to not be handled very well by uh, Lee Carter. In the countries not so much affected, I think probably it would work reasonably well. Thank you. Thank you.